So today we have lower body one, which is typically done on a Tuesday, which is today. Um, and we're gonna be doing some split squats. We have been doing RDLs up until this point, but I've got a bit of aggravation in my lower back. So we're gonna swap that out for a lift with less axial loading. So not loading the actual skeleton, um, i.e. like spine, pelvis, or cage. So we're gonna get do some hip extensions um, and then finish with some accessory lifts. So what you're seeing now is the warm up protocol. Um, and obviously I default to the easiest way to facilitate that, which is ramp raise heart rate, activate the tissues you're gonna be using, mobilize the joints and then potentiate. So we've done the R, the A, the M. Now we're gonna potentiate, for which we're gonna be using some plyometrics. Now plyometrics are vastly misunderstood and for the, even those who do understand them, they tend to go straight from zero to 100, i.e. doing none, to doing like bounding, sprint repeats, box jumps or that sort of stuff. And a box jump technically isn't actually a plyometric exercise, it's more of a ballistic. So uh, in this, we're specifically looking at my body's ability to absorb um, external forces. So what we mean by that is a body can only produce force to the extent that it can actually decelerate it or eccentrically decelerate it. So here we're going to be doing some uh, deceleration. So literally just dropping off the box onto a single leg, um, which again is a progression. I'd start bilateral, then progress to unilateral and looking at how well my body can eccentrically decelerate those forces, isometrically stabilize them. And then if I needed to, could concentrically overcome that and create force as a result. So we're going to get into some plyometrics now. Right leg just doesn't feel very happy at all. Hopefully it fucking eases off as we get warmed up. So as I said, the goal there is to improve the way in which your body decelerates force and eccentrically overcomes that. Um, the reason these are so unbelievably, unmistakably important if you are going to look at doing endurance work, specifically ultra endurance, is you've got to think it's so much less about how much force you can create. The amount of force required to create locomotion is actually not that great. It's, think about how many repetitions and ground contacts you're going to have. And if you are doing that through faulty mechanics, you're going to break down so quickly, even with like really, really good biomechanics and movement function and what we call movement fidelity. After like a few hundred thousand steps, things can still start to break down at uh, different structures and ligaments and joint capsules and stuff. So you really can't speak highly enough the importance of actually fortifying those mechanisms. That's the whole point of strength and conditioning. You know, we're not looking to do fucking millions of reps, just enough at a slightly higher intensity in a safe controlled environment where we can look at actual landing mechanics and improve those if we need to. We'll save your ankles, your knees, your hips, your low back, and I'm doing it in an effort to prevent sort of pain and uh, subsequent injury in those areas. All right, so we've got three sets of four today. Oh, I fucking hate doing these. But I asked the question, I was like, um, what's the prognosis? Because I'm going to have to deal with this on the event. Like, we'll get it to a good place and we'll start strong. What's the prognosis? And he was like, oh, you can run on that for quite some time before you really start to fuck it up. He was like, so it's going to hurt and you need to be professional about it. But he's like, you're not going to, he's like, you're not going to be coming back in for surgery after you finish the event, touch wood. I was like, okay, well, that's good to know. <coughs> Um, so, this is my A series today, barbell back split squats. Um, I've spoken, been quite outspoken about the fact I don't do any back squatting. Um, we're at the stage of the preparation now where specificity is becoming more important. If you're in like a really generalized phase, like multiple weeks, dozens of weeks away from the event, sure, go with some, some back squatting. But one thing I see, come up as a common fault with this hybrid mentality is people assume they're going to be really good at running whilst also doing heavy lifts like that. Now, if you just want to be kind of good at, at okay, mediocre and multiple different things, yeah, cool, fine, knock yourself out. If you've got an actual event, i.e. for me, the MDS, at some point that has to be a degree of specificity, otherwise you're making an enormous trade-off. And when you look at me as an athlete, already um, like relatively well-developed in terms of lower limb musculature, do I have the necessity to be back squatting fucking multiple plates on a regular basis? Absolutely no, what, not whatsoever, because the risk reward is skewed massively against us in terms of CNS fatigue, injury risk, so on and so forth. So I've gone with the, the, the split squat and I've had a split squat variation in for probably the past 12 weeks, going from Zurchers to rear elevated, now to barbells. 
And then from sort of a loading scheme perspective, when you're in a generalized phase, to keep it very general, you know, you can afford to have more volume because you're right down the other end of sort of the readiness. So volume is going to be really quite high in your, in your running mileage and you're deliberately looking to accrue a degree of fatigue and then recover appropriately. And that's how you build fitness and conditioning and recoverability. As we're now within, what are we, within three weeks of the event, throughout that period of time, you're looking to remove volume, okay? Volume will determine how much fucking fatigue you accrue and intensity will determine what type. So if your intensity is really high, you're gonna get CNS fatigue, you know, you're gonna get burnt out <clears throat> from, from a neurological perspective. If your intensity is really low, but your volume is really high, you're gonna get a lot of physiological fatigue and you're gonna feel slow and sluggish, not gonna recover, so on and so forth. So across that, you know, you're looking from sort of more volume to like lower volume and slightly higher intensity. We're now at the point where we're peaking, so even intensity is down. Now you can go into the real weeds of, uh, of, of looking at percentages and rep schemes and RPs and all that sort of stuff. And I could talk to you for, well, I've studied it for 10 years, so I could talk for quite an extended period of time about that. But all you really need to understand is that when you start getting close within sort of four to six weeks or your, tr your final training phase of your event, Things should be snappier, you should be aiming to move them quicker, you should be aiming to move things faster, and you should be looking at a lot less volume. So today we've got three sets of four on the split squat, and again, I'm not concerned about percentages, RP, so on and so forth, I just want that to be fucking snappy. And if it wasn't moving quickly, I'd just reduce the load and make sure it was moving quickly, because that's the adaptation I, I'm looking for. And if you want to refer to the strength continuum, we're looking at speed, strength, and a little bit of power now, um, and we're looking to maintain that and head into so very well rested with minimal fatigue, but the CNS is doing good stuff for the event. Um, again, if we look at the, the sort of Dunning-Kruger effect, if, if someone's quite early on in that Dunning-Kruger effect, they'll have a propensity to go really into the weeds about nuances and percentages and rate of force development and velocities and so on and so forth. But ultimately, as you become more experienced, you realize that really does not matter. Like it's imperative that you have an understanding of it to not would be ignorant, but in terms of how it kind of carries over to your own training, have an understanding and let it influence your decisions, but have the ability, the experience, the wisdom to make a call on the day and just know what actual outcome you're intending and then let your intuition take you towards that. Okay, so that's A series done. Uh, at this point, we're not really paying too much specific attention to training tissues. We are um, going from a true needs analysis which is, well, where do I need to be strong? What shapes do I need to make? And then how can I develop the ability to, to be excellent there? So we've looked at like anterior movement and unilateral lower limb strength, balance, proprioception, so on and so forth with um, the split squat. And that's been nice and fast, nice and snappy. I actually haven't been sleeping that well recently. So the fact that the weights are getting faster and snappier means that I'm exactly where I need to be in terms of volume and intensity, which is fantastic. So now we're heading into B, um, which is going to be much more posterior focused. So we're looking at hamstring and general posterior chain development, hamstring and glute, glute specifically, a little bit of lower back, so on and so forth. Um, and for this, my favorite lift, looking at specifically knee flexion extension, is the glute hammer is bar none. Fuck your lying hamstring curls, seated hamstring curls, all that sort of shit. If you can get good on one of these motherfuckers, like your posterior chain will be absolutely, I don't even know the word, bomb proof, let's call it that. So we're going to do a warm-up set with a band, see how it feels. I always do a warm-up set with a band because when you're getting out to like the lengthened portion of the range, you can feel quite vulnerable, especially if the hamstrings are not fully warm, if they're a bit fatigued, that's when something's going to go ping or pop. So just a nice little bit of sort of familiarization to the exercise, get warmed up and have a feel of it, and then we'll make a decision about how much load. But again, we're looking for snappy, we're looking for quick, we're looking for building sort of strength speed here. Enjoying these fucking higher frequency, much less dense sessions rather than doing whole body doing upper lower upper lower it literally is like 45 minutes a nice amount of work without rushing around it's been even though it looks on paper like more volume across the week the volume equates to the same in terms of load lifted so the work's being done is the same but the sessions are shorter and it's got a clear intent and outcome so that psychological buy-in is like i know exactly what i'm doing get in bum 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 done out whereas opposed to it on paper your whole body sessions two or three times a week look like you're doing less, but you get in and you've got all this fucking work to do and you're like, Jesus fuck. And when fatigue's high, you get to like the two third mark and you're just fucking checked out. You just don't want to be there anymore. So that's again, where the importance of like athlete buy-in and psychology sometimes actually trumps. Even if you've written the best program on earth, 
but the athlete fucking hates it and doesn't want to do it and isn't engaged in the process, you're better off actually just kind of meet in the middle. Calf training tips, um, which might sound a little bit odd coming from someone who's currently doing endurance, but if you look at my ability to retain and build tissue in the lower limb, even whilst running up 60 miles a week, there's some credibility there. Add to that, I actually learned and was taught firsthand in person how to train calves by Ben Bukowski, Coach Kasim Hansen, um, Bryce Barm, I think his name was, and also Joe Bennett, aka the hypertrophy coach. The thing that most people do wrong when they're training the calves is they're bouncing. Okay, it's super fucking ballistic. So to that extent, it's actually very little about their, their muscle tissue in that moment. They're actually using a lot of tendons and other connective tissues um, to do like a stretch shortening reflex. So the first thing we'll do is slow it down, spend a ton of time on the bottom stretching the gastroc, make sure you can feel it. Second thing people do wrong is as they go to push up, like the foot like, uh, starts to go over towards the pinky toe, we start to rotate out like that, so again, we lose the majority of gastroc. So rather than thinking about going up, think about driving, like draw a dot on the front of your ankle and just drive that dot forwards. Okay, another way to think about it is draw a dot on your heel and try and connect it with like your Achilles tendon and just drive that fucking through the middle. Even if you do that now, whilst you're watching or listening to this, just stand in your living room, wherever the fuck you're watching, even in your office, draw a dot and try and push that dot fucking far forward as you can. I guarantee you'll get cramp in your calf from how hard that fucking gastroc is contracting. Use that same cue under load and I guarantee your calves will grow like a motherfucker. Try it. But again, if you speak to doing calisthenics and bodyweight stuff, most people are absolutely astonished that I'm like, I don't do any back squatting any leg pressing. I'm like, if you can get really good at doing stuff like that um, and recruiting and moving properly, the, your lower limbs will hypertrophy so much. Like ridiculous untold amounts. And I'm not one of those fucking hippie cunts who wears fucking no shoes in the gym and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is like, if, you're, if your fundamental human movement is very strong and robust, then you can express force at the extremities of range then you, you are going to hypertrophy like crazy and your movements will get a lot better. Excellent. Right, then you... I want to do a little bit talking about, um, I guess, concurrently training for hypertrophy and strength and endurance. So as long as I can remember, it's been uh, a sentiment and a belief and almost an attitude in health and fitness that you can't concurrently you know, build muscle and be strong and pursue endurance related goals. Now, the reason that I believe it's valuable to do the thing is because then it gives you a degree of experience about whether or not that's possible. I've known for the longest time that it is possible to maintain and build muscle and definitely to improve strength and power whilst improving aerobic fitness and anaerobic conditioning. You've only got to look at you know, rugby players as a fantastic example of that. But I was curious about whether or not it's possible in ultra endurance. Knowing what I know now, I categorically can guarantee it is possible to maintain at the very least and build or accrue lean muscle mass and definitely build strength while probably even going as far as running a 50k ultra. Having experienced it now for the guts of six months in terms of how much time and energy you need to put in, even to running a multi-day marathon, I know that it is possible to maintain tissue. My weight has stayed the same, give or take within a kilo throughout this entire process. And that's not because I'm superhuman, it's because I've spent an enormous amount of time looking at the overarching physiological concerns in terms of balance and strength and conditioning, and in terms of like managing stress to the best of my ability. So if we take one step down from that and look at what's um, a prerequisite to run a marathon, the amount of training volume and training miles per week is actually not that enormous. It's nowhere near as, as hard as people once maybe proclaimed it was to be. And you don't need anywhere near the same amount of rest if you're training your ability to recover and if you're managing lifestyle stresses outside of that. 
So the thing that I see people most often get wrong is they just try and bolt together a hypertrophy program like bodybuilding-esque and they bolt together like loads of running and just hope for the best. And ultimately, that's not progressive, it's not accumulative, it's not intelligent, it's not periodized, so ultimately it's going to fail. And therefore, it leads people to the belief and the anecdotal quips that, oh no, it doesn't work because X, Y, and Z. Well, actually, you know, you had a hypothesis, you tested it and it disproved your hypothesis. Whereas if we go back and we're more intelligent and we look at, okay, what is the actual intent and how are we creating periodic phases in our strength and conditioning? And are we matching and cross-correlating those with high volume phases or high intensity phases in our running? You can actually periodize the entire process, whether it be six months, 12 weeks. You can then periodize your training blocks, so like four week blocks. You can even periodize your weeks. So if you start your week, with your highest intensity running, how are you going to then map your strength and conditioning around that? So what I've seen an enormous amount of success with is doing my intensity work earlier in the week and my volume work from a strength, uh, from a, uh, a running perspective later in the week, which means that I can then create quite a big stimulus from a lifting perspective earlier in the week, and then I'm looking at much higher intensity but lower volume with my lifting later in the week. So Monday, Tuesday would be like, you know, higher volume um, upper and lower body sessions, whereas later in the week, it'll be much higher intensity, but much lower volume upper and lower strength and power sessions. And in doing that, I've actually been able to build strength on certain key outputs like split squats, bench press, lifts of that nature. I've been able to retain tissue, which may or may not be in my favor, we'll find out on the day of the race. And I've been able to gradually increase my aerobic capacity. Now the caveat here is if you're looking to run a really fast marathon, then obviously there's gonna be additional strain to that. If you're looking to run a really fast ultra, there's additional strain attached to that. Um, and ultimately then it comes down to specificity. So you need to understand what it is you're trying to achieve. If you want to be good in the weights room and good on the marathon road, then absolutely 100% is possible to pursue progress in both of those attributes. If you want to be exceptional at something, you're going to have to make a trade-off. So you need to understand your intent going into it. If you revisit my intent for the Marathon Sabres from day one, week one of the series, it was never to be a race winner. It was to be a completer, not a competer. I always knew I was going to be a donkey and I had strength and I was going to leverage that and fall on that. So I haven't been moronic and just continued to, to build muscle mass. I've paid my dues and I've done my diligence and I've done the hard work from a running perspective, but through intelligent progression and periodization, I've been able to maintain strength and gradually increase aerobic capacity. So I won't be the fastest on course. I was never trying to be. I had an intent, I created a hypothesis, and now I'm pursuing it. And as a result of doing the thing, all of the things that you know you learn about and that you study, and I've studied for over 10 years and had a good degree of experience in, I now have the highest credible experience in, in doing the hardest race on earth because you now have a skeleton, a blueprint around which you can wrap all these bits of information and create real mind maps and real models of how to best implement this informa information, how to execute upon it, how to regulate and, and, and change your physiological capabilities moving forward. So in terms of strength for endurance, is it possible? A million percent. Be clear on the intent, be very intelligent with your programming, progress it and use what's between the, the top two inches. And if you're not quite sure, well, ultimately this might come across as a bit salesy, but there's a reason why coaches exist. We do these things, we study it, we implement it to the highest level so we can reflect, review a hypothesis, and then we can teach it to others. That's why coaches exist. So if you're thinking about it, you want to facilitate it and you're not sure how to do it, I'm telling you it's possible, I'm showing you it's possible, and we can now show you how it's possible too. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, very good, thank you. I'm not used to not seeing you in the van. No, I'm in Norway. I'm there as of tomorrow. Not there, I'm just north of Oslo. Um, okay. Just for four or five days, just to decompress a little bit, get myself out of, out of work and uh, get some runs out in a place where it's not as depressing from a weather perspective. How are you doing? Is the energy returning? Slowly, slowly but surely. Um, it's been a... A collaboration, I think, of, of work pressures uh, and the training, obviously, that's just kind of a slow incremental increase. What's given me some solace is that I've spoken to a couple of the guys who I know are preparing for it, and they've been like, I'm fucking struggling at the minute. Um, and I was like, well, I was supposed to struggle, and it, it's finally hit me. I think we've done pretty well to get to this point before I've been like, fuck, I'm really tired. Um, 
but yeah, because of the, the work pressures as well, it meant sleep was impaired. Mm. And that when obviously sleep starts to go, there, right. then it was really difficult. But yeah, the body, like physically, mm. feels great. Like the strength is there. A little bit of a niggle in my lower back, but physio is all over it. Um, strength's there. And like, I feel fit. I'm just tired. Um, and I think, as I said, it's more work. Coming towards the end of the quarter, I think it was more that than anything else, to be honest. The main thing is uh, electrolytes. So up mm. until this point in time, I've been using just like a, a 1500 milligram sodium prior to, and then like a, uh, the precision hydration, like carbohydrates and sodium intra, which are like up to 30 grams of carbs per hour. And that's 500 milligrams of sodium. On the event, I won't have the capacity to carry the load required to maintain that, you know, so it will be, mm. be a trade off. So I'll be taking less food, obviously. So the main question I kind of had is, um, how would you recommend I approach an electrolyte intake during the exercise? Because I'll take something for before, something for afterwards to replenish, like a 15 mm. milligram. During, do you feel like the salt tablets will be um, enough? Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, I, uh, I, I have relied largely on the soil tablets uh, without any problem. Um, I think that it's the, it's the, just have some awareness of the dosing. So they are, um, they are 500 milligrams of sodium yeah. each, I believe. Um, and I think the recommendation from the medics is to take two tablets per bottle, which means the one and a half liter bottle. Yeah. So one gram per one and a half liters uh, in the beginning. And then as it gets hotter during the stage to double that to four yeah. tablets, yeah. that's going to be in the roadbook. They're going to tell you when you do the admin check. Yeah. Um, but I think that like as a standard dose, something along the lines of one gram per liter of water, I think is sort of sensible. I think it's good if you go there with no more than kind of eight kilos. Mm -hmm. But you know, okay, if it is like 10, I know you can carry it. So yeah. like, it's okay. Um, I think it comes down to a little bit how much food you think you're going to take. Yep. because the food is going to make up the biggest part the rough working calculation i've got at the moment i think my food came in at 5.3 and that mm. was that was averaging 3.4 calories per day so a considerable amount and i managed to get it down to five point yeah 5.4 kilos as i said i've invest mm. i've invested in um a good kit with my sleeping system like so mm. that my sleep mat isn't like a, 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 an air mat one of the um fucking, what's that brand Derma rests, like my, sleeping, yeah. my sleeping bags, one of the Yeti ones, coat is yeah. like 180 grams. So other than the um, the mandatory kit, which they make you carry, there's not like, I, I'm confident I can probably get it under nine, I think. I think so. Mm. Um, I think so. I'm, I'm like, yeah. I'm pretty, pretty happy with everything. So what I'll do is in the meantime, I'll go away and just, just get the, this tapering done, um, get my kit figured out, weighed in, and then even if we just have a catch up and then, and then we'll go from there. But I feel as confident as I'm able to be at this moment. I believe that we've prepared appropriately. I believe I've prepared my mind to the best of my ability. So now it's just a case of let's fucking find out. Let's see what it's all about. Imagine if like you just bought a different bit of kit. Like each one thing you were taking was 150 grams lighter, which you might not think anything about like for a coat or a fucking a sleeping bag or whatever the fuck but as you and i have discussed like that could 150 grams could probably get you 600 calories extra a day so it's fucking no brainer so just getting ready for actually the first run of this week um recently we've been running saturday sundays instead so monday is off from running so today is five miles or 8k with strides uh, for those of you unfamiliar what strides are they're a way in which we can allow ourselves to experience higher speeds in a run and therefore improve form without necessarily accruing any additional fatigue. So a stride is literally gonna be anywhere between 20 and 100 meters where you open your legs up to a fast but not maximal pace 
and then come back down, recover, and repeat. So it's not quite interval training. It's literally just enjoying running fast for a little bit and then going back down to a really steady pace. So five miles, steady pace. I'll do about six strides um, and hopefully not get too wet. Thank you.